Good evening and welcome to Digging Deeper. The purpose of our Digging Deeper moments is to take God's Word to God's world, and we're so glad you joined us. I'm Pastor John Hainan, the Executive Pastor. Pastor Bob's taking a short break from his Digging Deeper lessons, and we've been looking at biblical examples of what we call wilderness experiences, times when our walk doesn't seem to make sense to us and we struggle to figure out what our circumstances or feelings are meant to reveal. We've all gone through times of deep disappointment. Maybe we didn't get the promotion we thought we deserved, or were denied a job we thought was perfect for us, or were fired for what seemed to be an unjust reason. Or maybe a relationship we wanted to last a lifetime falls apart due to a betrayal, or we lose a loved one that we don't know how we'll live without. I know of a megachurch pastor whose five-year-old daughter died of a severe asthma attack. I know of another megachurch pastor with five young children whose wife experienced a medical episode that began a spiral of depression that got so bad that she ultimately committed suicide. Sometimes you feel like you're giving your best for God, but things happen that make no sense because we envision things turning out one way and then nothing is as we hoped it to be, and it rocks us. I want us to look tonight at the prophet Elijah. We read about him in 1 Kings chapters 17 through 19. He was probably the most famous of all of Israel's prophets. As a matter of fact, he came to be a symbol of the work of the prophets. When Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him, to the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses and Elijah appeared with Jesus on the Mount. Moses as a symbol of the law, and Elijah as a symbol of the prophets. In the book of Malachi, the last prophet in the Old Testament, God promises to send the prophet Elijah before the day of the Lord comes to prepare the way, speaking of the work that John the Baptist would do. And he's the only prophet that didn't die Instead, he was carried into the heavens by chariots of fire. So clearly, he is an important figure in the history of our faith, whom God used in miraculous ways. But he had a season of feeling alone and disappointed. One of his mountaintop experiences came in dealings he had with King Ahab of Israel and his wife Jezebel, both of whom were evil and led Israel into sin. Elijah told Ahab, that there wouldn't be dew or rain for the next few years, except at Elijah's word. And that's what happened for around three years before God finally sent him, Elijah, to Ahab with a challenge. Elijah had King Ahab bring the 450 priests of Baal and 400 priests of Asherah to Mount Carmel. He told the prophets of Baal to build an altar with a bull on it, and he would do the same. 1 Kings 18.24 says, then you call on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. The pagan priests tried for hours to get Baal to respond to no avail, no answer. Then Elijah built his altar, and to, to show off, he flooded it with water, which during a drought is extravagant in more than one way. And God answered with fire. First Kings 18, 38, and 39 says, Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. And then at Elijah's command, the false prophets were gathered and slaughtered. Then Elijah prayed for rain which is a whole other story about how he did that, that I don't have time to get into, but God answered and sent rain. What a victory. That is the very definition of a mountaintop experience. It doesn't get much better than this. But what happened next is strange for this mighty man of God, willing to face the false prophets, willing to stand up to the king, seemingly fearless as he walked in the power of the Spirit, he heard that the evil queen Jezebel had vowed to kill him, and he fled for his life. 1 Kings 19.4 says, He came to a broom tree 
sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Now, this is what disappointment can do. This is what feelings of failure can do. Think about it. If Elijah really wanted to die, Jezebel was more than happy to take care of that for him. The Bible says, then he slept, then an angel fed him, then he slept again, then an angel fed him again. There must be something said for taking good care of yourself in the midst of trials. And then he traveled for 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Horeb, called the Mountain of God, the mountain where Moses saw the burning bush and where God had given his laws, the Ten Commandments, and entered into a covenant relationship with the children of Israel. It was there that God revealed himself to Elijah in a very special way. It's not what I want to focus on, but you can read about it in 1 Kings 19. But in that exchange, God asked Elijah, what are you doing here? He actually asked it twice, once before he revealed himself to Elijah and once after. But both times Elijah gives the same response. 1 Kings 19.14 says, he replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left and now they're trying to kill me too. Now, many commentaries attribute Elijah's behavior to being caused by fear. I think fear plays a part in it. Jezebel was a scary, evil woman, and humanly speaking, she certainly was in a position to see to it that Elijah was killed. But I think there was something deeper that drove Elijah to run. I think he was dealing with disappointment with a feeling of unmet expectations following such a miraculous display of God's power. Elijah was deeply troubled by Israel's sin and the fact that they were worshiping other gods. When God demonstrated his power on Mount Carmel, Elijah was expecting a certain response. He expected a full-fledged return to God with repentance and revival. But that didn't happen. Israel didn't turn back to God even after proclaiming the Lord, he is God. Ahab didn't change. Jezebel, if anything, got more determined to disobey God. And revival didn't come, turning the hearts of Israel back to God. So when God asks Elijah what he's doing there on the mountain, Elijah complains. The tone of his answer to God seems to be, God, I did my part. I did what you told me to do. I took the risks, I put myself out there, but for what? Despite all that the Israelites have done wrong, they're killing all your prophets and I'm the only one left and they're trying to kill me. Where are you in all this? Now this wasn't exactly true, as is often the case when we tell ourselves a story based out of our pain and disappointment. He wasn't the only one left and God was still working. It just wasn't in the way Elijah had imagined it would be. And God's response to Elijah's complaints wasn't angry, but loving. He let him know that he wasn't a failure. This wasn't the end of the story, and God was still at work. In fact, God had more work that he needed Elijah to do. And God also let him know that he was not alone. There were thousands more that were following God. And God so wanted Elijah to know that he wasn't alone, that he gave him a helper, the one who would succeed him as prophet to Israel, to work with him until his work was done. Elijah went to that mountain feeling that his work, his ministry, his mission had come to a screeching halt, crashing around him in failure. But that was because of his own viewpoint, the way he looked at things. He left that mountain with the realization that his dream for revival and a restored Israel was in God's hands and always had been. Obedience was in Elijah's hands. Outcomes were in God's hands. So when you feel disappointed by the way things turn out, or when you feel like a failure, remember that God has a different story than the one we can tell ourselves. And he loves us, 
He's working on our behalf and he isn't finished with us. He has work for us to do until he calls us to himself. And he who began a good work in us will carry it on unto completion. He's always a faithful God who works to build us into the image of Christ. And in that journey, we are never alone. If this lesson helped you, please share it with a friend, like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, subscribe to our YouTube channel, or check out our Sunday Morning Live podcast on either Apple or Spotify. And please join us again next week.